Father, we come before you. In the name of your Son. We worship you for your mercy. Your kindness. We thank you for the years that have gone by. Your unfailing faithfulness. There is no God like you. In the heavens or the earth or under the earth. There is no person among men. Who can compare to you, O God. We're gathered here tonight in the name of your Son. We know, Lord, that every thought of ours, of him, about him, is too small. There are no words that can be comprehended or spoken to do justice to who you are, who your Son is. What you have done through him. But I pray, Lord, that by your spirit. You would speak what cannot be spoken. You would make clear to the hearts of all of us. Just how precious Christ is to you. And ought to be to us. Warm our hearts, Lord. Instruct our minds. Change us. Lord, life is so fleeting. Only a vision of your son can keep us from wasting our days. Only a proper understanding of his gospel can keep us from condemnation. Only the power of your spirit can enable us to proclaim him. Father, please help us tonight. Help us. And if there is someone here tonight, Lord, that does not know you. That maybe even is confused or embittered or angry. Rebelling, knowingly, unknowingly, whatever their case, Lord, whatever their cause. Pray that you would show them the gospel. They would be healed. Father, please help us. In Jesus name. Amen. Whenever I come somewhere for the first time. I do one thing, and that is I teach the gospel. Some of you may have come here tonight because you saw something on YouTube, something shocking or extravagant or a man who will say things that other men won't say. None of that is worth anything. The only thing that matters is the Lord Jesus Christ and a clear understanding of who he is and obedience in his name. If you're here tonight because you think something will happen because I'm here, I can assure you that it most certainly will not happen because God does not tolerate idolatry in any form in his church. There's only one hero in this story, and it is Jesus Christ. The rest of us are needy sinners. And the best of us would only be fodder for hell if it wasn't for the blood of Jesus Christ. And none of us have served him as we ought. And yet we're not walking in condemnation or with a filthy conscience because his blood was poured out for us on Calvary. Men are just men. And if God speaks through them, it's only his proof that he still speaks through rocks and donkeys. And that's all. 
Tonight, I'm not going to shout. I'm not going to criticize anyone. I'm not going to point out a false teacher if that's what you came for. I preach about my beloved. You know, sometimes people have gone on the Internet and they said, you know, it seems like you always preach the same thing. I say, yes, I always preach the same thing. And I never get tired of it. Never. And even though I write books and work on things and publications for different publishing houses and all sorts of things and have to spend a great deal of time in my study every day, hours and hours and hours. There is one thing that I do almost every day of my life, and that is spend a few hours for the last 25 years doing nothing but studying the gospel. Now, you would think. You know, the gospel, it seems that we in North America are able to condense the whole thing into a little track. I've heard people say, well, what's the big deal about the gospel? I mean, I understood the gospel when when I was converted. I mean, now shouldn't we go on to bigger stuff? There is no bigger stuff. And no, you do not understand the gospel, and neither do I, nor Gabriel or any other archangel in heaven. The only one who can fully understand the gospel of Jesus Christ is God. Because it is that profound, it is that infinite in wisdom and glory. I often tell students who are bantering back and forth about the second coming, I tell them, you'll understand everything about the second coming on the day that it happens. But you'll be an eternity in heaven 10,000 eternities and you still will not have comprehended in its fullness the glory of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's not that you have to, you know, discover something new every day. Like the hymn writer said, that old, old story. It never gets old. It never gets old to the believer. Jesus Shed his blood for me. You want to grow in sanctification? You want to grow in godliness? This is the mystery of godliness. This is the great mystery that leads to all godliness. You know, let me tell you this. I love the law of God. I believe that all of the Bible is inspired. I believe the dust of the book is gold. But nothing promotes sanctification and growth in love for God and love for Christ and a desire of holiness, at least for me, like spending three or four hours simply studying Gethsemane. Or Calvary are those few hours of pitch blackness. I want so much for you to grow in Christ as I want to grow in Christ. And I know that you're like I am in many ways. You lament the fact that you've been so many years in the faith and you haven't grown quite as much as you thought you would at the first. I can tell you this. The greatest way to motivate the genuine believer. To greater and greater godliness and greater and greater passion for God. It's to know more about what God has done for us in his son and the worth of that son. So, you know, this is my first time in this area of Canada. It's very beautiful. Now that I'm working with some brothers that I feel privileged to even know, I don't suppose, barring from God taking me home, that this will be my last turn here. And so I plan to start today what may be a lifetime, at least what I have left, of coming back to this area to build upon what I'm going to teach today. And that is the cross. And tomorrow night, the cross. And the next night, the cross. And when I come back the next time, the cross. And maybe in somewhere around 35 years, we'll get somewhere to family and things like that. But I guarantee you this. If you understand the cross, you will be a better husband and a better wife a better father, a better, fa- better mother, a better son and daughter. You understand the cross. You'll be transformed. 
A lot of people hear me on YouTube and they think I'm the meanest man that ever walked the planet. That may be true. But when they come to my church, they'll sometimes, well, a group came to my church one time. It's a church I attend. And the elders had asked me to preach. And after I got done preaching, they came for several weeks and I was preaching several Wednesdays. They went up to one of the people in our church and said, has Brother Washer compromised? And the elder said, why? He goes, well, we've been here for several weeks now listening to him preach. And all he's preached on is the love of God. The pastor said, yes, the love of God. That's primarily what Paul preaches on. It's just someone else puts all those mean sermons on YouTube. My point is this. If you are an unconverted church person and with the number of people that are here tonight, there's probably some of you here. You're in church. You may have been in church 20 years, but you're unconverted. It's all tradition. It's all just by rote for you. There's no passion for Christ. Then the more I teach about Christ, the more you will either tune me out or the more angry you will become. That's what the gospel of Jesus Christ does to people who just have religion. But if God has regenerated your heart and made you spiritually alive and the spirit of God is is dwelling within you, then the more you hear about Christ, the more you will be changed and the more you'll want to know about Christ. So tonight I want to start with some fundamentals of understanding the gospel. And I want you to open your Bible to the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus, chapter 34. We're going to kind of march our way through several passages until we get ourselves into the New Testament, because I want to show you the reason for the gospel. The reason why the gospel is absolutely necessary. And also, when you when you learn this or when maybe you know this and this is iterated in your mind and heart, I want you to think about this. This is what the world doesn't understand. And this is what you must explain to the world. You see, some of you who are my age and maybe even younger, 55, I'm 55 and on up. You were born in a time when even back in the 80s, you could share the gospel and people would understand you to some degree because there were some remnants of ideas of evangelicalism, even in the secular mind. They understood some things about God and sin, but that's not the case today. And you know that very well whenever you try to share the gospel, especially on a college campus. I have discovered that I can't simply say man is a sinner doesn't matter or even begin to to talk about certain things that everyone used to know about God. People don't know them anymore. So you need to explain why there is a gospel, why the need of a gospel. And that's what we're going to look at. Look at Exodus 34. In this passage, we have one of the greatest self revelations of God in the entire Bible. This this Exodus 34 passage is sometimes looked over And Isaiah 6 is given more prominence. And Isaiah 6 is an amazing passage. But this is also a great revelation of God. Look in verse 5. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him. That is Moses. As he called upon the name of the Lord. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression and sin. Now, if I were to read that on even a secular television show, I'd probably receive applause. Because I'm saying all kinds of things that even secular people think that they believe about God. God comes down and what does he tell Moses? He tells Moses a lot of very, very good news. This is going to be good news to absolutely anyone. He says this, the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate. Now, before we get to passionate, look at the repetition here. The Lord, the Lord God. Now, what is going on? 
I mean, why is he doing this? First of all, you must understand that the Bible does not open the door for any God other than the God of Scripture. And that is the God of Yahweh, the God of the Bible. Now, I want you to look at this for a moment. This is what you're going to see in evangelicalism in the next 15 years. You are going to see a great many people, even considered conservative evangelical, who are going to waver on this. Because the great crime in the next couple of decades is going to be this. Not saying that Jesus Christ is a savior or that the God of the Bible is a God. The great crime against humanity that some of you will commit is this in saying that not that Jesus is a savior or that God is a God, but that Jesus is the savior and God is the God. That's the first thing that you must understand. God establishes his deity at the very beginning. And if someone doesn't submit to that, if they do not grab a hold of this one great truth that God alone is God, then you have no gospel. You have nothing. So don't think that that later on in life, especially some of you young people, you're going to be able to hang on to some of your Christianity and at the same time be friends with the world. Because these first few proclamations, the Lord God, the Lord God will be enough to get you sent to jail. But if you compromise on this, there is no gospel. The Bible teaches there are not many gods. There is not the same God with many different names. There is one God. He's the God of the Hebrews. He's the God of Abraham. He's the God of Moses. He's the God of David. He's the God of the prophets. He is the God who reveals himself supremely and uniquely and exclusively in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, who is this God? Who is he? It says here, he is compassionate and gracious. Com, in Latin, with, passion, suffering, suffers with. He's a God who cares for the weak. He is a God who has pity. He is a compassionate God. He is gracious. Some people have defined mercy and grace in this way. Mercy is when God does not give you what you deserve. And grace is when God gives you what you do not deserve. And that's who he is. And not just to his people all over the world. Everywhere you look, we see that God is compassionate and God is gracious. You say, Brother Paul, how can you see that? Are you blind? Are you blind? You see all the evil in the world, the wars and the storms, the climactic changes and all the things that are going on, the abuse and the death and the crime and the murder and everything else going on. How can you say God is compassionate because God didn't murder anyone? All all the crime, all the death, all the evil you see in this world comes from one simple source. Your heart. Your heart. Yes, there's enough evil in the world. That if in one moment the world was made crystal clear again, immorality would abound just with the evil coming out of your heart. God is compassionate. Think about it. Adam and Eve sinned and the entire world was brought under judgment. And yet in that judgment, there was still grace. Now let's multiply the sin of Adam and Eve over and over and over into billions and billions and billions, countless billions of crimes against God. The question is not why do bad things happen to good people? The question is, Why does anything good happen at all? I see people today, especially when I'm on a college campus and they're going, how can you say God is compassionate? Look, all that's going on. Do you realize 
all of us have sinned. And because of that sin, there should be nothing in this world but sadness and darkness and pain and misery. The fact that there is still joy, that grass is still green, that parents still have babies, that there is still rejoicing in marriage, that all these wonderful things happen is a work of God's compassion. God is a compassionate God. God is a merciful God. And he demonstrates that mercy every day. Day. So Moses, he says to Moses here, the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. Slow to anger. Since 1961 or 62 in the United States of America, we have killed somewhere over 60 million babies. Slaughtered them in the womb. I don't know how many Canada has killed. Or Europe. Is that not enough for God to have already destroyed the world countless times in a flood of Noah? Is that not enough right there for God to strike every, every human being on the planet for the crimes that we have committed against his own creatures? God is slow to anger. Slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. Look what else it says. Abounding in loving kindness and truth. Verse seven, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression and sin. What kind of God is in the Bible? This kind of God. He forgives iniquity, transgression and sin. Now, why does it pile those three terms together? It's very important to understand this. In the Hebrew mind, we have what's called Hebrew parallelism. When a Jew wants to emphasize something in ancient literature, he doesn't write it in bold. What does he do? He repeats it. He says it over and over and over again. And here we see this. God forgives every type and kind of sin. That's who the God of the Bible is. Now, thus far, the revelation of God to Moses is very clear, very beautiful. It's good news. We have a God over this world who is slow to anger, who's abounding in loving kindness and truth, who is compassionate and gracious and merciful, so merciful that he forgives every type and kind of sin. But now let's go on to the next section. In verse seven, he says, who forgives iniquity, transgression and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Here we have the gospel. Right here, you now understand why Christ had to die on a tree. Look at the text. Look at what it says. On one hand, God forgives all types and kinds of sin. On the other hand, it says God will punish every type and kind of sin. Now, the great question in the Bible is how can God do both things? And that is what the entire Bible is about. That is what all Scripture is coming to. Throughout Scripture, we see this problem beginning even from Adam's fall to the very crucifixion of Christ, one great question is found in the Bible. If God is just, how can he forgive sin? If God forgives all types and kinds of sin and then says he will punish every type and kind of sin, how can both things be? And the answer is found in Jesus Christ. You see, the great problem in this world is not just that man is a sinner. The great problem in this world is that God is holy. And if God is holy and separates from sin, and if God is just and will always punish the sinner, then how does God forgive the sinner and draw him back into communion? How can those two things be? That is the great question in all of the scriptures. He forgives All types and kinds of sin. He will punish every type and kind of sin. How does he do that? 
2,000 years ago, God becomes man. In the person of his son, Jesus Christ. He has the merit and the worth, the infinite worth of God. He lives on this planet for nigh on 30 years. He lives an absolutely perfect life. And on Calvary, he takes the sin of his people upon himself and every ounce of wrath, every drop of punishment that should have been measured out to God's people is poured out on the head of Jesus Christ. Thus, Isaiah says it pleased the Lord to crush him. How can God forgive all types and kinds of sin among his people? Because he punished every one of those sins in his son, Jesus Christ, on Calvary. If God is just, how can he forgive sin? God can be just and forgive sin because he punished that sin when he crushed his son under the full force of the wrath that was due his people. That is why when Jesus Christ was on the tree right before he died, he said, it is finished. What does he mean? It's paid. God cannot simply forgive sin. Sin must be atoned for. God's justice must be poured out. It was poured out on that day, on that tree. And when Christ had suffered according to the decree of God, the exact measure that God decreed was finished. God can now be just and say that he has punished all types and kinds of sin. Yet God can say that and be just because he punished all types and kinds of sin. No, not upon you, but upon his son, Jesus Christ, who stood in your place. Many, many years ago, there was a young man converted that I know very, very well. He was kind of a big guy on campus. I'll never forget this guy. I mean, he just he was just the big guy. And one day. Someone told him about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he was graciously and powerfully converted. The next day, someone gave him a Bible and he started reading that Bible. A few days later, to his friend's horror, they found him standing in the middle of the campus. He had gathered a bunch of tracts from a preacher that had given them to him. And he was standing out on campus and he was handing out tracts and he was preaching about Jesus. A total transformation. His friends grabbed him, pulled him aside and said, what are you doing? People are laughing at you. Girls are making fun of you. Everyone thinks you've lost your mind. What are you doing? And the young man said this. Did he die for my sin? Did he die for my sin? Did he pay for my sin? They said, well, yeah, everybody knows that kind of stuff. That's what, you know, he, yeah, Jesus died for sins. That young man then said, well, then what else can I do? If he died for me, I must live for him. Now, even though he had not been schooled in theology, he did not know the original languages of the text. What had happened? The spirit of God had revealed one simple truth to him. He was guilty, guilty, guilty. He must die, die, die. But Jesus died in his place and he was never the same man again. I know him. I can testify. It's been the same ever since. Just growing stronger. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you ever weighed this fact? That you are truly sinful enough to languish under the judgment of God for all eternity. Have you ever grasped that in your mind? Have you ever sat down for a moment, pulled yourself away from TV, all the noise of our culture and just looked in the mirror at your heart and realized what you are? And then have you ever grasped the fact that the precious, holy son of God died for you? Well, I can tell you if you've grasped that to any degree. I can tell you how you'll know. Have you changed? 
Has anything changed? Have the affections of your heart changed? Or have you remained the same? I knew the testimony of a young man. He was converted in this way. He don't know. How, he doesn't really know how he got back to his apartment one night. Still a mystery to him. But he woke up at about five in the morning. It was still dark. The cold linoleum on his face. Laying on the floor. Felt sticky. Dirty. Picks himself off the floor in a dr- drunken stupor. Goes over to what he thought was the bathroom sink. Flipped on a light. Discovered he'd slept the entire night in his vomit. And then remembered. Something someone told him. Jesus died for sinners. He was never the same again. You see, you can read this passage and you go, oh, this is wonderful. He forgives all types and kinds of sin. And then you go on and you read and he punishes all kinds of sin. If the spirit of God is truly moving in your heart, you're going to say, hold it. If he punishes all types and kinds of sin, he must punish mine. And he, if he must punish me to the degree that I deserve, then there is no hope for me. And you'll either be left in despair or the Spirit of God will draw you to look upon the gospel. And in looking upon the gospel, you will find freedom. And not only will you find freedom, you will find life. And in that life, you will walk and you will live and you will grow. Am I describing you? Or do you just have some religion? Or are you just a good person, sort of. I don't want to know if you're faithful to a church. I want to know if you love him. Because of who he is, because of what he's done for you. God forgives all types and kinds of sin. God punishes every sin. But for those who trust in his son. The sins they have committed. Have already been punished. And for them there no longer remains any wrath. Let's go on. I want you to look for a moment. At the book of Proverbs. Look at chapter 17, verse 15. Here's another one of these verses that is something like what we saw in Exodus. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous, both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. Now, look at that. Look at what it says. He who justifies the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. God is saying in his holy word and his word cannot be broken. Anyone who justifies a wicked person, and that means declares a wicked person to be right. That person is an abomination to God. It's an abomination. And that word in Hebrew, that's about the worst thing you can be. Now, here's the problem. God says that anyone who justifies the wicked is an abomination to him. And yet the New Testament tells us that God justifies the wicked. God justifies sinners. How can God do both things? Only in the person of Jesus Christ. The moment you believed, if you believed savingly in Jesus Christ, the moment you believed God legally declared you to be right with him. And from that moment, he treats you as right with him. But the fact of the matter remains, you're a sinner. You were a sinner from birth. And even after your conversion, you continue sinning. How can God justify you and not be an abomination 
if everyone who justifies the wicked is an abomination to God. Again, the answer is found in the person of Jesus Christ. On Calvary, your sin was imputed to him. When we talk about justification, many times people only tell half the story. They say this, the moment you believed in Jesus, God declared you to be legally right with him. And that's true. That's true. But that's only half the story. Justification is this. The moment you believe savingly in Jesus Christ, God declared you to be legally right with him. And he from that moment on treats you as legally right with him. He will never again see you as an enemy. He will never pour out even a drop of wrath upon you. Even when God disciplines you, he disciplines you as a loving father and his disposition of love does not change. So the moment you believed in Jesus, God legally declared you to be right with him forever. And he began to treat you as perfectly right with him. How can he do that? Because on the cross, your sin was imputed to his son. God legally declared him to be guilty and treated him as guilty. Have you never heard, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Have you never read Isaiah 53 and it pleased the Lord to crush him? You and I, because of our sin, should be separated from God throughout all of eternity. But in order to save us from that separation, God became a man, bore our sin and was separated in our place. You and I should suffer the wrath of God throughout all of eternity in order to save us from that wrath. God couldn't simply say, I do not punish you. I'm no longer just. No, God took care of your sin. What did he do? Your sin was placed upon Christ and all the wrath of God that should have fallen upon you and me fell upon him until payment was complete. Let me give you an example. Let's say that you go home tonight and you find your family murdered on the floor. And you find the murderer standing over your last child, wringing the last drop of life out of their body. And you control your sense of revenge, but you run across the floor and you throw the murderer to the ground. You tie him up and call the police. And the police take him to the jail. And then after a while, he's brought out of the jail and he's going to appear before the judge. All the people in this town know of the devastating murder. The heinous crime that was committed. And so they're all in the courtroom and they're standing there. And the murderer of your entire family is standing there with blood on his hands. And the judge says this. I am compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. I forgive all types and kinds of crimes. Therefore, I forgive you. You're free to go. What would you say? Would you say justice had been served? Would you be pleased with the verdict? No, you would say that the judge on that bench is far more criminal than the very man who murdered your family. You'd begin to write politicians and governors and and prime ministers and whatever sort of leader you have in political office in this town. And you'd begin to say, I demand you remove this judge. Why? Because a judge must do justice. The God of all the earth. Must he not do justice? Have you not committed crimes? Is it not true that every sin, the wage of it is death, eternal death? And you've committed more sins than you could count with a calculator. Your sins are heaped up over your head. You're drowning in them. They all cry out for your condemnation. Creation itself comes together and cries out, demands justice, that you be brought to justice. If God is just, he can't simply forgive you. He must do justice. And there are two ways of doing it. Justice can be poured out on you. Or you can receive mercy because the justice due you was poured out on his son. 
Let's look for a moment in Micah, one of the most beautiful passages in the whole Bible. Micah chapter 7, verse 18. Listen to what Micah says. Who is a God like you who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious act of the remnant of his possession? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in unchanging love. Again, it starts out just like Exodus, telling us all these wonderful things about the love of God. But is God not just? Can God simply turn his face away from sin? Can God pass over sin, cover it up, put it under a rug? Can God just say, I'm not going to deal with it? No, he is holy and he is just. So what does it say in verse 18, verse 19? He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. I want you to think about this. How many songs have been written about this text? Micah 7. Look what it says. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. I can't tell you since the 1980s how many songs I've heard about God treading our sin under his feet. And they're beautiful songs. But then goes on. He will cast all our sins into the depth of the sea. Countless songs are written about that, and rightly so, because it's beautiful. It's beautiful to know that God has taken all my sin and he has treaded upon them. It is beautiful to know that God has taken all my sin and cast them far away from me into the sea. The problem is we don't understand this text. Christologically. God didn't take your sin off of you. Throw it on the ground impersonal ground and stomp it. God didn't take your sin off of you, roll it up in a ball and cast it into the sea and watch it drop to the very bottom. That's not what this text is teaching. God took your sin off of you and placed it on his son And crushed his son under his feet. Under the wrath of God. God took your sin off of you. And my sin off of me. And placed it on his son. And hurled his son into the sea of the wrath of almighty God. That changes it quite a bit, doesn't it? But that is what had to happen. Do you remember when they're crossing the sea? Basically, these disciples who knew Jesus was a carpenter, basically their attitude is kind of like this. Now, Jesus, we're going to you want to cross the sea. We're going to help you. Don't worry. You're a carpenter. We're fishermen. We know this sea like the back of our hands. We got this under control. You just go in the bow and go to sleep. He goes across, the great storm comes up, they are terrified. He comes out and he rescues everyone and tells the sea to be calm. And you think, oh, what a marvelous story. It is a marvelous story and it does demonstrate his deity and his power over creation. But you've got to see it in the context of redemption. Remember the book of Jonah? Where was he when the sea came roaring in? In the bow of the boat, asleep. Where was Jesus when the sea came roaring in? The bow of the boat, asleep. What did Jesus say about Jonah? Or rather, what did Jesus say about himself? One greater than Jonah is here. You see, Jonah, everyone knew in the Hebrew story that this is a disobedient prophet. And so he gets in this boat running away from God out of the will of God and God sends a storm against him. Now, before they get in that boat, what are all the Pharisees saying about Jesus? What's going on here? False prophet, disobedient prophet at best. Don't you think that's kind of ringing in the ears of those disciples? I mean, all the religious leaders are saying this guy's false. They get into a boat. Jonah got into a boat. Jesus said, go the other side. Jonah's going to the other side. Jesus is sleeping in the bow. 
Jonah was asleep in the bow. And a great storm comes up. Could those disciples have been thinking, oh no, maybe the Pharisees are right. This is a Jonah. What are we going to do? Jonah says, throw me in. Throw him into what? Into water? That water wasn't dangerous because it was water. It was water because it was stirred up by whom? By God. And what did it represent? The wrath of Almighty God. Christ, though, comes out of the boat. Does He say, throw me in? Absolutely not. He has not sinned. What does He say? Be calm. And it was. And say, well, what's the parallel? Calvary. Where Christ willingly took the place of the sinful and threw Himself into the wrath of Almighty God. You see, you need to understand something about judgment and you need to understand something about sin that is often overlooked. People will always tell people your great problem is sin. That's not necessarily true. Your great problem is God. Now, why is that a great problem? Sin would not be a problem if God was different than he is. Let me explain to you. Let's say there's a mafioso from from Sicily. He's been caught in a crime, a terrible crime. And so he's caught by the police. But the police think it's kind of strange because he's smiling. They put him in jail. He just smiles. He's not bothered a bit about going to jail. The day they're leading him into the courtroom before they get into the courtroom, he's kind of telling jokes. He's laughing. He's nonchalant. Why? Because he knows the judge. And he knows that the judge is just like he is. The judge is just like him. He is a corrupt judge. So when he walks into that courtroom, his crime, his sin is not a problem. Why? Because the judge is just as as just as corrupt as he is. But the terror of that mafioso when he walks into that courtroom and realizes they've changed the judges and he's no longer looking at a judge like himself. Corrupt and vile and sinful and criminal. He's looking at a judge that is notorious for perfect justice. That crime of that mafioso was not a problem for that mafioso until it brought him before a righteous judge. In the same way, you've got to see something. God truly is love. You cannot say it enough. You can't say it loud enough. You can't say it as much as you should. God is love. God is love. God is love. God is love. I can say that at any time, anywhere, to anybody. God is love. And have to apologize because I haven't said enough about it. God is love. But God is just. I have heard evangelists say this. I've heard them tell people, instead of being just with you, God was loving. Well, if you've studied logic, that means God's love is unjust. But God's love is not unjust. God is love, but God is also just. And he cannot lay aside his justice even in the name of love. He must punish sin and he must punish the sinner. And if you choose to stand on your own before God, you will be punished, even though as God punishes you, he will still be love manifesting itself in righteousness. But God's love has also manifested itself in mercy and that God gave a substitute, his son, Jesus Christ. Christ took your place. I have been preaching now for 34 years. I preach a lot. I have a family. I love my family. The closest thing I come to idolatry is my wife and my children. And even though I am 55 years old, I have a six month old baby. Surprise, surprise, surprise. I love my family. I have to leave them all the time. I left them today. I will leave them next Friday for Hong Kong. And then the next week I will leave them for Frankfurt. And then Paris. 
and I will miss them. There's only one reason that would cause me to do this. My substitute. That's what I want you to get into your mind. Everything you do, you don't do it because it's right. You don't do it because it'll somehow give you your best life now. You don't do it because it's good. You don't even do it for a good reputation. Everything you do, you do for this substitute. Without him, you have nothing. And that makes him everything. You do whatever you have to do as long as you have to do it. You sacrifice as much as you have to sacrifice. You do what he calls. Why? Without him, you have nothing before God. Nothing. Our religion is different than all the other religions in the world. They all follow a teacher's teaching. They live in light of a teacher's teaching. We live in light of a teacher's life and death and resurrection. We don't save ourselves by following him. We are saved because he died in our place as our substitute. And that's what Micah is getting at here. Now let's go to one last place. Go to the book of Romans. Chapter 3. Chapter 4. A verse that you have read from the book of Psalms probably countless times and you've rejoiced in it, but you haven't maybe realized what you're reading. Look what it says. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Hold it. God covers sin. What do we call a judge who covers sin? Corrupt? We say, at least in America, maybe our judges are more corrupt than yours, but we say he swept the crime under the rug. He made it disappear. He made it go away. Lifted up the rug, swept it under, covered it nicely. No one knows it's there. We call that a corrupt judge. And yet the Bible has us rejoicing in the fact that God covered our sin. Now, I know you've read that many times and you've sang songs about it and you've said, oh, this is wonderful, but you haven't realized what it took for this to happen. How can God cover sin? He can't turn his back on sin. He can't ignore sin. Throughout all of Scripture, he says, I must punish sin. Why must he punish sin? Because he's forced to by some external force? Absolutely not. He must punish sin because of who who he is. He is holy and he is just. So how can he cover sin? He can cover the sin because the sin was punished. How? In his son. You see, in every one of these texts, there is no answer. Until you get to the sun and the answer is found. The only way God can save you is because Jesus died instead of you. The only way God can save you from his own wrath is because God became a man and suffered that wrath in your place. And in suffering that wrath, he extinguished it. And he satisfied justice. And now God can declare you right with him and treat you as right with him. Not because you follow some teaching perfectly, but because you have cast yourself upon the son who died. You've cast yourself upon him. In my country, I don't know, and it's also I know in other countries they do this. I don't know about Canada. But when a governor or a president is leaving office, he is granted with some restraint the power to pardon people who are in jail. Now, he can't do it abundantly without bringing suspicion to himself, but he can pardon people that he wants to pardon. So can the governor. And a lot of times I've heard evangelists say, that's what God did with you. No, that's not what God did with you. 
You see, many people who are actual criminals, who have actually committed crimes, but have been pardoned, it has been noted that they, many of them have lived the rest of their life in misery. Some of them have even committed suicide. They were pardoned. They were set free. Why do they live in misery? Why do they commit suicide? Because of their conscience. Well, what's wrong with their conscience? They're free, but the crime was never paid. They're free, but the crime eats at them and eats at them and eats at them because they had never paid it. It would have been better that they'd have stayed in prison, served the entire 20 years, because then they, when they got out, at least society would have said, you have paid in full and their conscience could be clean. That's not Christianity. You as a Christian have been pardoned, though you were guilty. But you can have a clean conscience. Why? The crime is not outstanding. The crime was actually paid for. It was paid for. It is no longer in the books. No outstanding crime. No guilt. Perfect freedom. Declared righteous by God. And God is just in declaring you righteous. Why? Because he himself paid for your crime. God in his justice declares you and me guilty, guilty. And objects of his wrath. God in his love becomes a man, lives a perfect life, takes your sin and my sin upon himself. And in suffering the wrath that we deserve, his demands of justice are fully satisfied. And now God can do what Paul talks about in chapter 3, verse 26 of Romans. God can be both just and the justifier of wicked people because he himself paid for their crimes. That's what the gospel is all about. Many times when I'm sharing the gospel on an airplane, on a college campus, to a truck driver, ditch digger, doctor, doesn't matter. I will begin with this. Do you want to know what the greatest problem in the Bible is? Do you know what, want to know what the entire Bible is written about? I mean, from Genesis all the way to the end. Do you want me to summarize what the whole thing is really about? And they'll say... Well, yeah, if you can do it quickly. Okay, it's about this. If God is just, He can't forgive you. And immediately the wheels start. To, what do you mean God can't forgive me? God's love, isn't He? Yeah, He is. But He's just. You're a criminal. If he forgives you. He's not just. That's what the Bible's all about. That's what Paul's argument in Romans 3 is all about. How can God be just and the justifier of wicked men? Because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died for wicked men. And when he said, it is finished, he paid the price in full. Now, what must men do to be saved? I know about modern preaching. I know that if I was a modern preacher, and I'm not, that what I would do is now call up some music people. I'd get you to bow your head and close your eyes. I may even have you repeat a prayer after me. And if you pray that prayer and you're really sincere, then I will just popishly declare you to be saved. I will declare you to be saved. And then I'll go to my next meetings and brag about how many people got saved in this town. But then most of the people who got saved won't ever show up in church. Is that not what happens? And then they're called carnal Christians and they live the, their entire life in sin, drunkenness, immorality and everything else. But the preacher who pronounced them saved in church that day, 20 years later, will also pronounce them in heaven. And by doing that, he will continue one of the greatest false teachings that's ever come out of the United States of America. 
How are men saved? Well, I think we ought to go with Jesus on this one, don't you? Repent of your sins and believe the gospel. For Brother Paul, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. Yeah, with repentance and faith. Because he says also many will call upon me on that day and I'll say depart from me. I never knew you. What is repentance? I mean, what, what really is repentance? I mean, the Bible's clear. Mark chapter one. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. And don't just think that was some uh, different dispensation because Paul in preaching an act said God's calling now every man everywhere to repent. He said, I taught you repentance toward God and faith in Jesus Christ. That was Paul's preaching. But now we just tell him, repeat a prayer. You know, I heard one evangelist do this. Honestly, I heard him do it. He told the guy, you want to go to heaven? The guy said, yes. He said, well, pray and ask Jesus Christ to save you. And the guy said out loud. He said, yeah, he goes, well, I I really don't know how I don't feel comfortable praying. The evangelist said, well, I tell you what, I'll pray it. You repeat after me. The man said, well, there's people around. I feel uncomfortable. You know what the evangelist finally said? Okay, here's what we'll do. I'll pray the prayer. And if it's what you wanted to say to Jesus, squeeze my hand when I'm done. Behold, the power of God in American evangelicalism. Jesus said, repent and believe the gospel. Salvation is not of works. It is a gift from God. You can add nothing, nothing, nothing to save yourself. It is totally of grace. Jesus made it quite clear. Repent and believe The gospel and both of those are a work of the spirit of God in the heart of a person that cannot be manipulated or created by some evangelist. The evangelist can only preach. It is the spirit of God that must make your heart repent. Cause your heart to believe. Wake up your heart. Give it life. It's what's called being born again. What is repentance? It means change the mind. Well, that sounds superficial. Well, if you use your mind, it won't sound superficial. You're all sitting here very calmly right now. Your pulse is not racing. Why? Because you don't believe this auditorium's on fire and it's not. But if you thought, if your mind changed, if your mind changed. And you thought this auditorium was on fire. What would happen? Everything. Absolutely everything about you would change. Would your emotions change? Absolutely your emotions would change. Would your will change? Your will would change. Would your actual actions change? Yes, they would change. You would no longer sit there calmly. You would jump up and run through the door, run over people, jump out a window, but you would get out of here. You see, the mind is the very control center of everything you are, your will, your emotions, your actions for the mind to truly change. About something makes everything change. Let me give you an example. Greatest example of repentance I know in the Bible, the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus, he left Jerusalem for Damascus. In his mind, he believed that Jesus Christ was the greatest false prophet that ever walked the planet. In his mind, he believed that the Christians were enemies of the people of God and enemies of God and should either be imprisoned or killed. That's what he thought with his mind. And that's the way he acted. He went to hunt them down. He stood there at the stoning of Stephen and agreed with it. Because he thought in his mind that Jesus was a false prophet And that Christians were the enemies of God. On the road to Damascus, what happened to Paul? His mind changed. It was cataclysmic, wasn't it? I mean, it was unbelievable. Standing before him is the resurrected Jesus Christ, the one he had been persecuting, blaspheming, hating him. He realizes, Paul the Apostle realizes that he is wrong about 
Everything, the very fabric of reality tore apart that moment for the Apostle Paul. He was wrong about everything. Do you see that? In his mind, everything he thought was important, he was wrong. He thought Jesus was a false prophet, the greatest false prophet, only to find out he's the Messiah and the son of the living God. He thought Christians should die or at best be imprisoned. And he finds out that he has become the greatest persecutor of the people of God. He was wrong, totally and completely wrong. What happened? He goes to Damascus. Believing in Jesus Christ, proclaiming Jesus Christ and giving his life for the people of God. He repented. It wasn't a work. It was a change of his heart, change of his mind. Just like faith has works or it is dead. So repentance has works. John was very careful about that. Bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. It doesn't mean that you repent and work. It means that if you have truly repented, your emotions, your actions, your will, everything will change. Just like Paul. Now, let's put this in modern day. A young guy's hockey player. He's lived all his life lifting weights, everything else. Hockey, hockey, hockey. It's an idol. It's an idol. It's everything. It's everything. He's now 18. Man, he's college. He's just doing it. Everything looks like the pros are his. He lives, eats, drinks and sleeps hockey. It's everything to him. Then one day as he's getting ready to go into the auditorium. The hockey rink. There's a silly little teenage preacher handing out tracts at the door. And before he's chased away, he's able to give that rising star a track. Kid puts it in his bag. At night, he's a little bored. He's sitting at home. He's sore. Pulls the track out and just begins to read it out of curiosity. The Spirit of God begins to move. And what happens? He realizes he's wrong about Everything, everything he thought was important is rot. And what happens? He changed his mind and everything else changes. Doesn't necessarily mean he stops playing hockey, although it may mean he stops playing hockey. Now he's under new direction. There's a new Lord. There's a real reason to be alive. Young girl, she's 15. She's beautiful. She knows it. Everybody does. I mean, she is gorgeous. Stands in front of the mirror every day. She's looking at the mirror, thinking about clothes, reading magazines, thinking about boys and prom and school. And one day she sees a girl sitting in the cafeteria that's kind of the ugly duckling of the class. And she seems to be reading something. She walks over to make fun of her. But all of a sudden she sees it a Bible and she sits down and she says, just what are you doing? And the girl, humbly and meekly, tells her the gospel story. She's really troubled. She tries to laugh it off. She's with her friends that night. She's pretty miserable. She drinks more than usual, goes home, looks in the mirror. And sees nothing but ugliness and sin and vanity and filth and rot. Everything in her mind changes. She begins to live for Jesus Christ. Businessman, he's lived all his life, man. He everybody in town knows him. He's got the best cars. His families go to the best schools. They got the biggest house. They got everything. They own the businesses. They're respected. They're feared. One day he picks a track up off the desk of one of his employees. About to get angry about that fanaticism that seems to be spreading in his business. But he decides to take a look at it just to get some information so that he can deal with the employee. And he realizes that he is the biggest fool who ever lived, that he has sold his own soul for a few pennies. He realizes he's wrong about everything and everything changes. That's repentance. But it's not just realizing you're wrong. 
It's throwing yourself upon Christ. The Christian is utterly and totally convinced that they have only one hope of heaven. Jesus Christ died for their sins. I can't tell you how many people in evangelical churches, Methodist churches, Presbyterian churches, Baptist churches, independent churches, Bible churches that I've been in. That they will tell me and there's a bit of caution in my spirit, they'll say, well, uh, yes, I'm a Christian. I'm believing in Jesus. I am. And I go, now, are you really sure? Well, I'm doing my best. Well, are you really? What, what's that all about? Well, I'm working really hard. And, and eventually you see they're not trusting in Christ at all. They've never really come to understand if I died right now after 30 some years of preaching. After being a missionary for 10 years in the jungle, after everything I've been through, if I died right now, I would go to heaven for only one reason. Jesus Christ shed his blood for sinners. That's all. Not one shred of self-righteousness to boast in. My very best Moment in life, if God judged me in my very best millisecond of life, it would only earn me hell. As a matter of fact, if God took the finest second of every believer who ever walked on the planet and rolled it up into one person and judged that one person for the sake of the rest, it would still only earn us hell. What are you trusting in? Because if you're trusting in one shred of self-righteousness or a good work or something you have done, you are not yet trusting in Christ. Are you trusting in Christ alone? We've seen that God is just. We've seen that God is holy. And we've seen that although God is love, he will not lay aside his holiness and his justice. To do so would bring self-destruction to God. But he has satisfied his justice in the death of his son. And the only way you can draw near to God is through what his son has done for you on Calvary. He died for your sins. He rose again from the dead. He reigns from heaven. He offers salvation to all. Now, do you realize you are wrong about everything? And do you see now that your only hope is Christ, Christ, Christ? We're not going to have a song, not because I don't want to see people saved, but because I don't want to manipulate people. We're going to have a prayer and we're going to dismiss. But if there's someone here tonight and you're concerned about your soul, I won't pray a little prayer with you up front. But I may be willing to stay with you until six o'clock tomorrow morning to work through this. I won't deal with you like a number. I won't treat you superficially and get you to pray a little prayer and make a cross over you and pat you on the back and say, welcome to the family of God. But I will tell you, I will take you into scripture and show you what repentance is. And then the spirit of God will show you if you've repented. I will take you into the scripture and show you what faith is. And the spirit of God will show you if you have faith, because the spirit of God using the scripture is the only one who has the right to tell you you're saved, not some preacher. You should be telling the preacher you're saved, not the preacher telling you. When the spirit of God is truly working. Let's pray. Father, I come before you tonight and I pray that you would work in the heart of people. These precious, precious people. I pray that Christians would be strengthened in their understanding of the gospel. I pray that if there's someone here tonight who doesn't know you or is unsure about their knowledge of you. Or someone who knows they desire to be saved, but are still confused. Father, I pray. Draw them to yourself. And give us ministers strength to love them enough to counsel them long if necessary. Lord, help us tonight to deal with your people. And those who are yet your people. In Jesus name.